I now call to order the Society's 1,459th meeting in what is now the 151st year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's lecture on the Mars Rotocraft Ingenuity by its creator and chief engineer, Bob Bellaram of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Tonight is the 91st annual Joseph Henry Lecture. Whoops, where is it? Honoring the founder, first and longest serving president of PSW, Joseph Henry. We will therefore, after thanking our sponsors, begin with a few words about Professor Henry and tonight's use of the Society's ceremonial gavel. Thereafter, we will make a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2458th meeting and the talk by John Randall and Rahul Saini on implantable medical micro devices. We will then turn to this evening's Joseph Henry lecture, followed by a question and answer period. When the Q&A session is done, I will present a thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, thank those who make PSW possible, and adjourn the meeting to a social hour. The Society is grateful to the sponsors of the 2021-2022 lecture series for their support. The Policy Studies Organization, in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous donor who's asked to remain anonymous. We also want to thank the generous sponsor of tonight's lecture, the intellectual property law firm, Millen White, Solano, and Brannigan, PC, and me, where I'm a partner. Tonight's lecture is the 91st annual Joseph Henry Lecture honoring PSW's founder, first and longest serving president, Joseph Henry. Henry served as president of the society from its founding in 1871 until his untimely death seven years later in 1878. He was the preeminent American physicist of his time, an American Maxwell, and also perhaps the most prominent American scientist of all of that time. He's best known for his many contributions on electricity and magnetism, and for his finding that a powerful magnetic field is induced by flowing current through an insulated conductor wound around a ferrite core, leading to the development of very much stronger electromagnets. His work on induction led directly also to the invention of the telegraph and later to the invention of the telephone. In fact, Henry developed early versions of the tel telegraph and consulted with Samuel B. Morse who ultimately invented the telegraph system that came to be widely adopted. Among his roles in founding and serving in many other institutions to foster science in America, Henry also was the founding secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. His death was headline news, not only in America, but also around the world, and here in Washington, D.C. The city quite literally closed down to mourn his passing. We honor Henry today with this annual series of lectures on important topics of the day in science that would certainly have interested him. We also honor Henry today by using the society's ceremonial gavel carved from timbers of the White House, recovered during the Truman Reconstruction of 1849 to 1852. The timber used to make the gavel originally was used in the White House Reconstruction of 1815 to 1817 after the British, those of our famous special relationship, burned it to the ground in the War of 1812. I am pleased to announce the following new members. Tonight's Henry speaker, Bob Bellaram, who learned of PSW from our invitation to him to speak tonight. And some of his interests will be clear from tonight's talk. We welcome him to membership. If you're not a member, and would like to join PSW or support the society, you can do so through the PSW website using the blue join button on the upper right hand corner of the home page. We welcome new members and we greatly appreciate donations. 
Special Project Director Cameo Lance, standing in for Recording Secretary James Heelan, will now read the minutes of the 2458th meeting and the lecture by John Randall and Rahul Saini on ultra miniature medical implants. Cameo, the stage is yours. Thank you kindly, Larry. On May 6, 2012, from the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., and by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called together the 2,458th meeting of the Society to Order at 8.06 p.m. He welcomed new members, and the Director of Special Projects read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, John Randall. The CEO of Zyvex Labs, Executive VP of Teleatry, Inc., and Executive Vice President of NanoRetina, as well as Adjunct Professor at University of Texas, Dallas. His, his lecture was titled, Ultra Miniature Medical Implants. Randall began, the, in, began by introducing the concept of retinal implants. He showed a blank black slide intended to simulate blindness, then briefly explain the optics of the eye. Rods and cones, he explained, receive information, then turn that information into electrical pulses carried by the optic nerve, then a realization is done in the back of the visual cortex of the brain. The speaker then discussed three different approaches to developing a bionic eye. First, the epiretinal bionic eye concept, which entails placing electrodes on the surface of the retina. Second, the subretinal bionic eye concept, in which the retina is peeled back and electrodes are placed on the rods and cones. The nanoretina concept, third, entails putting light sensors on the surface and then penetrating electrodes behind the retina. However, he explained, each of these methods have drawbacks, especially the size of the implanted devices. The implantable devices previously used large titanium housing with laser-welded seams and low-density feed-throughs. Their team developed a miniature-sized platform approximately the size of a grain of rice. Their concept produces an extremely small implantable pulse generator, or IPG, which uses non-conventional biocompatible materials. With this approach, they have achieved 600 IPG electrode with the highest density feed-throughs of any biomedical device by a large margin. It uses high-density penetrating electrodes invented by the team and a wafer-level manufacturing approach, which allows for scalability. Their chromatic feed-through wafer is made of glass and sapphire, which allows the ability to go from inside of the IPG, where all of the electronics are, to the outside in a hermetic way such that the electronics can be embedded. This new approach to making active biomedical devices enabled the team to develop a retinal implant and begin animal and human trials. The advantages of these devices, the speaker explained, can be seen when looking at chronic diseases, such as heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, chronic neurological disorders, and more. Some of these conditions already have active implant therapies that are in human clinical trials. The speaker emphasized that the six out of 10 Americans have at least one of these chronic diseases at some point in time. The speaker then showed a video and explained a use case they are working on with a professor at the University of Texas, Dallas, who is interested in targeting plasticity therapy, which involves simulating the vagus nerve. Current physical therapy, he explained, enables a person with 10% limb usage to achieve 30% limb usage. However, with the vagus nerve implant, which floods the brain with acetylcholine, the portions of the brain that were affected in moving the arm get to rewire a larger number of nerve cells with both physical therapy and with this enhancement. In trials, targeted plasticity therapy has enabled people to achieve 80 to 90% limb usage. Next, the question and answer period began. One of the members asked about the challenge of shrinking battery size down as the size of microelectronics decreased and if energy harvesting or wireless charging are feasible alternatives. The speaker responded that solid state batteries are small can be recharged quickly, and have a high energy density so that it is primarily the direction they are going in. 
Another member asked about implanted sensors of human arterial and venous blood pressure, and specifically if they had any blood pressure sensors. Rahul from Zoom Audio responded that they are actively working on a program to look at arterial blood pressure. He expressed excitement that it is an opportunity for closing the loop on therapy. Yet another question asked by a member asked about the similarities between their technology and Neuralink. Rahul from Zoom Audio commented that they often get compared, especially on the bionic eye side, to Neuralink. However, Neuralink devices are about 20 times bigger than the nano retina device. After the questionnaire answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein adjourned the meeting at 9.57 p.m. The temperature in Washington, D.C. was 20 degrees Celsius. The weather was clear. The number of streaming online viewers was 51, and views from the PSW, YouTube, and Vimeo channels in the first two weeks of lecture was 179. Respectfully submitted, Camille Lance, Director of Special Projects. Thank you so much, Cameo, for the excellent job summarizing the previous lecture. If there are any comments uh, or corrections to the minutes from the live audience, hearing none, if uh, anyone who's listening online has any comments, they can text them to the corresponding secretary, which is uh, corresponding sec, S-E-C, at pswscience.org. In the meantime, if there is a motion by a member to accept the minutes as read. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. And therefore, the minutes are accepted as read unanimously and will be posted to the website in due course, uh, subject to any corrections necessitated by any comments that come to us via electronic means. And we now turn to tonight's speaker, Bob Balaram, and tonight's lecture on ingenuity, the first controlled powered flying machine on Mars. Bob is a principal member of the staff at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. He's been with JPL since finishing his doctorate. Bob's research interests focus on the design and engineering of planetary rover and rover rotocraft the design and engineering of entry, descent, and landing systems, high-fidelity physics-based modeling and simulation, the application of simulations technology to verification and validation of space exploration systems, rover and aerobot navigation, telerobotic systems, and the validation of autonomous systems. Bob is the originator of the concept that became the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars, and he served as the chief engineer for Ingenuity throughout Ingenuity's design, development, test, and operational phases. In addition, he led a strategic research and technology development project to design and develop future helicopters for future scientific missions on Mars and other planets, building on the success of Ingenuity. Previously, Bob researched precision landing methods for Mars as well as advanced simulation techniques for planetary descent and landing systems. He led the team that developed a high fidelity EDL simulator that was used by the Curiosity and Perseverance missions. He's the co-developer of a simulator for planetary rover navigation and control. He led design teams for developing Mars Aerobot perception systems, the deep diving Venus balloon gondola concept he is also a co-developer of the Rocky 7 rover platform, a prototype and precursor to the new generation of rovers, such as those on the Mir mission. Bob earned a B.Tech, or Bachelor's of Technology in Mechanical Engineering, at the Indian Institute of Technology and an MS and PhD in Computer and Systems Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. All questions will be fielded. In the Q&A session following the lecture, Bob, the stage is yours. Thank you, Larry, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, honored to be here to present the Joseph Henry Lecture. I 
found out that he was from Albany, New York, which is just across the river from RPI. So, you know, in a way, it's a bit of a coming back home, if you will. So, um, talk to you about Ingenuity, and here is an image that was taken by the colored camera on Ingenuity. Okay, so there's a telltale sign for every color image that we take on Mars with our helicopter, and that's because it's got that little round thing on the side, and that's one of the feet is sticking into the field of view of the uh, camera. Now, that's a pretty spectacular image of a region in Mars called Seta, uh, which we've been flying over for the last uh, year. But actually, it's not my favorite image. My favorite image is actually um, this one. It's a little black and white image, and uh, it's what the uh, helicopter's navigation cameras see when they're flying. And it's, uh, you'll see why it's my favorite image in a little while. So I want you first to sort of all visualize a place on Mars. Imagine that you're exploring Mars and you have a rover. And what you have available to you is a map there on the left. And um, your rover has landed somewhere in the, the sort of the north eastern quadrant of that picture. And you want to get down to that interesting area that you're seeing in a satellite image. Here on the right is a zoomed up version of that image from an orbital image. We have on Mars orbiters, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It takes pretty good images for being up in orbit, but you can still see it's kind of a coarse image in the sense that uh, you can't see too much detail. But nevertheless, you know, you want to get down there and explore there. Now imagine that we actually had that same area resolved at much higher resolution. Imagine you had something like this, okay? That's the kind of stuff that you can get from an aerial image. Furthermore, if you have a number of these aerial images, you can actually reconstruct a three-dimensional shape of that terrain. And this is what really you would like to see before you take all the trouble of driving all the way down around that, <laughs> to that spot. So the idea of having a scout that would allow you to look at that region in unprecedented present in the detail before sending a very expensive asset that takes many, many days to get there is very compelling. But what it would really require is you would need a, some kind of flying vehicle that would follow essentially that green path that I've shown out there. And you'd like to take a number of images from a vantage point, which I've indicated there on the top there, high resolution views. And once you have that, you can get that kind of image that you cannot get from orbit. Now, don't get me wrong. The rovers are getting extremely high resolution images, but they're only getting it where they're at. They're not getting it kilometers away, okay? So the ability to have a forward scout, taking aerial images, really enhances the science return of the mission. And one of the sort of side stories here is that uh, we were meant to be just a technology demonstration. Go there, prove that you can fly, and be done. But we started returning images like this, and then the scientists fell in love with us, which is why the mission's been extended and we've been still flying you know, over a year, not just for a month, but over a year. Okay, now obviously to make something like this happen requires a great team. It's not just the folks at JPL and Caltech. Um, major parts of our rotorcraft system were built by a company called AeroVironment in Simi Valley. Um, folks at NASA Ames, and Lassa Langley uh, did a lot of the analysis work that helped in the design. Um, our, our very high-end processor, basically a cell phone processor from Qualcomm. We have a state-of-the-art solar panel from a company called Solero. And Lockheed Martin actually built the gadget that deposited us gently on the surface. We hitched a ride on the rover, but Lockheed was responsible for getting us to the final uh, surface, so a deployment device. So this was the team, a really great team that worked wonderfully well together to make this uh, project happen. So it's really, you know, a, what seemed when it all started as a distant dream because um, there were a number of people who said this is impossible and I'll tell you why, for good reason, they thought it would be impossible. And so it was a distant dream. In some ways, it's very much like another dream from over 100 years ago, okay? This is the uh, Wright Brothers flyer at Kitty Hawk. Uh, by the way, a little bit of a plug. 
on National Aviation Day coming up in August. Uh, the National Park Service is working with the Kitty Hawk folks and us to set up a parallel displays of Ingenuity and the Wright brothers. Sort of, we'll have an overlay map of you know Mars on there, and you can walk the trail of either the Wright brothers' flights or the Ingenuity flights. But in many ways, that was also a pioneering flight with a lot of unknowns, a lot of naysayers, and so we had a similar kind of journey to get there. And it's many, many challenges. And um, I really resonate with uh, what Orwell Wright said that, you know, if you all worked on the assumption that what is accepted as true is really true, then, you know, there's little hope of advance. So everybody at JPL, even all the way from the top chief engineer, were very skeptical about this whole idea of being even feasible. But uh, we persisted, and uh, it's turned out to be quite a success. So what makes all those skeptics you know, sound pretty reasonable. Well, one of the main things is that Mars really doesn't have much of an atmosphere. If I take a cubic meter of air, you know, three feet by three feet by three feet, here on, in this room, that cubic meter would weigh about a kilogram, two pounds. That same cubic meter on Mars is about 15 grams, 18 grams on a good day, so about a half an ounce thereabouts. It's about the same as being at 100,000 feet on Earth. Now, flying under those conditions. Now, there have been propeller-driven aircraft that have flown at 90-something thousand feet. Uh, NASA had an aircraft called the Helios aircraft, so flight is not unknown. But it, there's just not enough air. And you know, this basic Newton's law, in order to get lift, you got to push stuff in the other direction. And if you drive 1% of the air, you're going to have a problem achieving lift. So that's sort of problem number one. And it's the first thing that jumps out at you as something that needs to be solved. The second thing there is space is for spacecraft. You're an aircraft. You're trying to get to Mars. And so what that really means is that the thing you have to build is not only an aircraft, but it also has to be a spacecraft. And that's two very different disciplines. It's not the same design principles, design rules, it's not the same communities. And so getting that hybrid thing, a, a spacefaring aircraft, you know, getting there is not easy. You're uh, on, strapped onto rockets, which are really just big controlled explosions, a lot of vibration, a lot of G-loads, a lot of vacuum in space, radiation, all sorts of problems getting there. Then. We were, as I said, a technology demonstration on what was a major flagship mission. This Perseverance rover is looking for signs of past life on Mars. It's gathering samples. It's sealing them in little tubes to be eventually returned back to Earth for further analysis. And it's a multi-billion dollar mission. And the last thing you want is some kind of tech demo gadget that you strap onto. It's snarling up the works and causing problems. Um, which is one of the reasons why the scientists really didn't like us in the beginning. They said, you're a distraction. 30 days out of our precious you know, lifetime, we're going to give to you this tech demo. Uh, we're distracting the project management by all your peculiar needs. Uh, but uh, luckily, you know, the NASA administration at that point uh, was uh, bold enough to say, let's, let's go for it. Um, so you're on a flagship mission, and then you're essentially a hitchhiker. And there are lots of issues with safety and cleanliness and all kinds of things that if you were just a little lonely little CubeSat launching on a little rocket, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about all of these things. But you, you face all of those problems. It's also very far away. You are operating. Uh, that little blue dot is where you got to operate this helicopter from. That's Earth. And what the real problem is that you have a time delay, tens of minutes, just the speed of light. So even if you could want to joystick it, for example, it would take, you move your joystick, 20 minutes later, you would find out whether something actually happened or not. So even your, your favorite teenage son or grandson or teenage daughter would not be able to have the skills to work with those kinds of time delays. So there's a lot of autonomy that's needed on board the uh, aircraft to, so that it can navigate, maintain its own health, maintain its own temperatures overnight. Um, and all of that has to be done in a very small package. So it's, it's difficult to operate something that's a flying vehicle. A rover, 
If it runs into problems, could stop, you know, and call back home. If you're flying in the middle of the air, there's really no place to stop, you know, and so and call home. So there's a higher level of autonomy in some very basic things for a very dynamic vehicle flying in an environment like that. And the conditions are harsh. Uh, the main thing is that it gets very cold at night. It gets down to about minus 80, minus 90 degrees centigrade at night, which is about a minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so what we do is we actually run heaters through the night, trying to keep all electronics and our batteries warm. But if you've been following the news lately, over the last uh, two, three weeks, Martian winter has caught up with us and we no longer have enough energy to keep ourselves warm through the night. So we're actually freezing everything in the night. And then come morning, like Lazarus, we wake up. By we warm up the battery, we charge the battery, a little computer boots up and says, where am I? Uh, I must be on Mars, and then starts trying to talk. So we are actually right now for the last two weeks or so, we've been actually been experiencing the brutal cold all the way for all the components. But normally, we have heaters and things. But still, it's a pretty tough place. And I should also mention that there's radiation and other things. Which, so it's not, just, it's not a benign environment by, by any stretch of the imagination. So let's, let me take you through the space-sparing aircraft. What was the journey of how did we overcome all these challenges and get to the point where we are? So this is the first flight. Uh, you can see that we are gathered here in the operations center at JPL. Um, I'm there on the top right. I didn't take my COVID vaccine in time, so I wasn't allowed to be with the rest of everybody. And some of us so similarly. So there's some people that were remote, some people that are local. And this was April 19th last year, where we had our first flight in Mars. And that flight was of Ingenuity. So this is the actual picture of the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, all prated up for its uh, little beauty shot before we sent it off to Mars. And I just wanted to reflect a little bit upon the fact that, uh, you know, that previous stuff was streamed on YouTube and Zoom and Facebook and everything, and everybody knew what was happening. Well, many years ago, you know, there was a similar small spacecraft. Um, and this was the Western Union telegram sent by the Wright brothers. Uh, success, four flights Thursday morning, all against 21 mile per hour wind, starting from level with engine power alone, average speed through the air, and so on and so forth. So that was December 17th. So it's kind of funny, both as technology and in the way we spread information and news has come a long way. And there is a connection here where we wanted to pay homage to those first pioneers of flight. Uh, so what you're seeing happening here is the one thing on Ingenuity that is not an engineering item. Right below the solar panel out there, uh, tied to a cable bundle, is a piece of fabric from the original Wright Brothers flyer. Um, the folks at the Dayton Experience, uh, the Smithsonian, you know, checked out the whole provenance. Basically, the Wright brothers were selling off fabric pieces to raise money for their future aircraft. Uh, fundraising is always, uh, you know, I think nothing changes that way. So what you're seeing out here is a couple of engineers installing um, a piece of the fabric. It's the size of a small postage stamp. They're wrapping up in some Kapton tape, and they're putting it on the aircraft, so that piece of fabric flew a number of times at Kitty Hawk, and it's flown 28 times on Mars. So it's a little homage to that pioneering effort. Um, and so that's the, I was there in the clean room with my little cell phone camera, so it's not a very professional camera. Um, and it was kind of hush-hush for a long time because NASA management wasn't quite sure how to deal with it. What if it crashes? Will it look bad that we sent a piece of, what if? Anyway, so finally, just the few days before the actual first flight in a press conference, you know, I got to announce that we were paying homage to the Wright brothers with a little piece of fabric, a little itsy bitsy piece of fabric. So uh, that was pretty cool. So I'm going to walk through aspects of the design. Now, there's just so many things out here to talk through. So I'm going to touch up on a few of them. 
Stuff in blue, I'm gonna go a little bit more just to give you a flavor of you know, the backstory behind some of these things. But every one of these things has a story. But uh, Larry's only given me an hour, so. Uh, we, we... So the, um, the blade, tip to tip, is 1.2 meters. That's about four feet. Um, and these airfoils are special in the sense that they're, since they're working in the very thin air of Mars, they're not your standard fat sort of airfoil. They're very thin plate type of airfoils. Um, there's a number called the Reynolds number which characterizes you know, how much viscosity versus how much inertial forces you have. And you're working in a low Reynolds number regime and the blades are actually designed to sort of bite into the, that thin air and still generate lift. I mentioned the very thin air, 1% of Earth. So the way we compensate for that is spin the blades faster. So we spin the blades at 2400 RPM or higher, depending upon the density. And so there's a very high speed motor. There's, the motors are very efficient, and I'll get to that in a second. There is a lithium ion battery pack, which gets charged up by the solar panel, which is that thing on the top. And the actual battery pack is inside that boxy fuse sludge. It's kind of at the heart of it. It's what we try to keep warm through the night, except for these last few weeks where it's freezing out. Um, and it can generate and produce and support 500 watts of power if needed. But normally when we are flying, we are in the mid 300 watts. Uh, so it's, we have enough capacity in the battery to support our flight. The entire thing is 1.8 kilograms. That's four pounds. And that was the main challenge through the entire design. I'm a backpacker and I know that Every gram counts when you do backpackings. You know, sometimes if you have a backpacker friend, they're very anal about cutting off little bits and pieces of their backpack and this and that. We have to do the same thing because it's very easy to build a helicopter that looks like a helicopter, but it won't fly on Mars. You have to have the mass really, really down in order to support flight. So all told, we were only four pounds. It's a lot of very fancy carbon composite uh, construction. Uh, we even use some very exotic uh, beryllium alloys uh, in some of the very lightweight, very high thermal capacities, so a lot of exotic materials. And you may have heard of a material called aerogel, uh, which is sort of this solid, solidified smoke, supposed to be one of the best insulators. Yes, it is, but it was too heavy to use on the helicopter. Not so much because it was heavy, but it has to be encapsulated in something, and the, once you look at the mass of the encapsulated aerogel, it turned out that you don't need it. What we are instead using is the carbon dioxide gas that's already there on Mars serves as an insulator for us. So we use what's known as a gas gap. Uh, I know there's a thermal infrared person somewhere in the room, so it's CO2. It, CO2 is a pretty good insulator, um, and that's what we use. So let's dive a little bit into the, the motors. So, to summarize, we needed our own Charlie Taylor, and this is where I draw again on the analogies to the uh, Wright Brothers experience. Who, who was Charlie? Charlie was the guy who built the engine for the Wright Brothers. So he was asked to build an eight horsepower engine, low, lightweight. So in six weeks, he produced the 1903 engine, which produced 12 horsepower. So we needed to spin these blades fast at very high efficiency. So so we had AeroViment's Matt Keenan, who wound our propulsion motor. The first propulsion motor took 100 hours under the microscope to, to be wound. Now, why did it take so long? We wanted to get as much copper into the windings as possible. And one way of getting copper to be efficiently packed into a volume is to use square cross-sectional wires as opposed to the round. You go from 91% packing efficiency to a theoretical 100% because all the squares can nicely line up and be perfect. But the trouble is that once you have something like a square cross-section wire, you have to be much, much, much less forgiving on the winding. And this is a 23-pole pair system, and it it's, uh, took Matt Keenan 100 hours under the microscope to do it. Um, we're using some pretty exotic beryllium all alloys to absorb the heat because this motor is generating waste heat and there's really no way to go for that heat to go. So we actually absorb it in the motor housing. 
So this beryllium metal is uh, very good at absorbing the waste heat. And all the drive circuitry and things are out there in the cold. So this is a very special, very high efficiency motor which was built to support flight on Mars. So that's a little bit of a backstory on that one component. There's a lot of autonomy. Uh, I mentioned that we have to be, we can't do any kind of thing like joysticking. And really we learned a lot about helicopter flight by building this vehicle. It turns out that on Earth, you can have a pretty floppy helicopter blade. And when I say floppy, as it's spinning around, the blade wants to go up and down and flap. But in the thick atmosphere of air, that flapping mode gets damped out. It doesn't get, cause too much trouble. On Mars, with that thin air, that flap mode causes problems with the vehicle control. So we learned that the hard way. We, and, and it had to revisit some fundamentals in helicopter flight. Um, our NASA experts in helicopter flight were all excited because for the first time, they actually had a new problem. Uh, so you couldn't use the same old rules of thumb. And I'll show you some little bit of experiments related to that in a minute. We're running our control loops 500 times a second, so 500 times a second. All the sensors like uh, uh, accelerometers and gyros and a laser rangefinder are being queried. We are taking 30 images a second of the ground. So basically, as we're moving along the surface, we're taking images 30 times a second and look, comparing image to image, we see how much we've moved. So that tells us you know, what is our velocity as the ground velocity. And so there's a nadir pointed camera that's doing that. Um, one comp very interesting aspect of this story is that you may have heard in the software world, there's a whole open source stuff. This is a testimony to the open source frameworks and mess. Our helicopter's top level process is running Linux. Okay, so there's Linux running on Mars. Um, the software that runs the generic software, which is called F Prime, which runs on the system, is available for anybody to download. Now, there are some specific helicopter-related modules that you go and get, but you can download the F Prime open source flight software framework and build your own spacecraft software with it. So that's, it's, it's a tremendous thing that the open source movement, in fact, everybody who contributed in some way to the tool chains and the software in the Linux world received a Mars helicopter badge, you know, as part of their uh, thing. That's what the Linux Foundation and worked with, with, with us to do that. And so there's about 5,000 people on the planet who have a Mars helicopter badge because they contributed a piece of software for free out of their own, they didn't, they didn't know it was gonna be on the helicopter. So there's about 5,000 people who have helped in addition to our own software engineers who made this thing possible. So it's, it's, it's a whole side story about the whole open source movement out here. We are using a smartphone processor. Now, if you bought a uh, Samsung Galaxy from about six, seven years ago, that was a processor you, know, you had from Qualcomm. It's, that processor has 150 times more compute power than the main processor on the rover. And the reason is there's a venerable old processor called the RAD750 that has, was developed in the 1990s. And every NASA mission conservatively uses it because it's been radiation hardened. And people say, well, I don't want to do anything else. We couldn't do that. It was, first of all, it's huge and big. It wouldn't have been able to fit in anything. And it just didn't have the compute power to keep this unstable vehicle flying with all those c controls that it's doing. So it's running, it's 150 times faster. And it's doing all our vision algorithms, it's doing all the command and data handling, and it's all the telecom. And it's just, uh, so I have said that that helicopter has more processing power than everything, every other interplanetary spacecraft put together. You add it all up and it's still, you know, because we're two orders of magnitude more powerful than anything that's flown before. Um, we have, we borrowed some technology from the automotive industry. Uh, so every time you do something with your brake and you think you're actually pressing something mechanical, there are little microprocessors doing the job for you to make sure you stop. They are very fault-tolerant, redundant microprocessor, microcontroller units. Uh, we're using those to uh, some of our lower-level controls. So we have Linux all with a snap cell phone thing on top. We got a bunch of automotive processors in the bottom. 
And, and then way down at the bottom, we have what's known as a field programmable gate array, which is a radiation tolerant you know, piece of hardware that's you know, is sort of the, the spinal cord of the whole system. So let's talk, talk a little bit about, delve into the controls. Okay, when we started all of this, um, we didn't realize that there were control issues, so we said like, okay, let's build a scale model, and let's demonstrate that you can fly it with a joystick, you know, because if you can fly it with a joystick, then it's only a matter of programming the computer to do whatever the pilot was doing, right? So we have a test facility at JPL um, where it's a big chamber, but 25 feet wide and about 80 feet high, you can pump it down to vacuum, put back carbon dioxide so that it looks like Mars at the right, you know, 1% density, and you can fly there. We just joystick and show that we have flight. So that's checkbox, right? So we got in there, a very experienced drone pilot, um, before pumping down, rehearsed. Yep, I can fly this thing. Let's pump it down and let's fly. And uh, this is what happened on December 19th, 2014. So he's having trouble controlling it, you can tell. So he's had no problem while it was regular air. It would just go up, hold steady, and he would land it. And he's just struggling like crazy. Um, and you'll see what happens in a second. Okay. Okay, so I've joked that we should give credit to JPL management for sticking with us uh, <laughs> after that thing. So they said, you know what? You gotta handle this. We, they funded a risk re reduction program to basically get to the bottom of what this control issue is and make it work. So what we did is we abandoned the scale models. We went to the full scale, you know, the four feet one. And we said, okay, let's just focus on building a rotor and all the controls. Let's not worry about where the computer is and where the part, let's put them under the floor and then run a cord underneath and let this vehicle fly by itself, you know, with the computer and power supply down in the basement. So this was May 31st, 2016, in a 25 foot chamber. So we licked that problem. That's the first time anything has flown under Mars-like conditions. Not on Mars, in that little chamber with all the computers under the floor and so on and so forth. And that was, you know, 2014 to 2016 was getting to the point where we could, knew we could fly on Mars. Now comes the hard part of actually making a spacecraft out of the whole thing, you know, that's, that's, that's. So, if I had known that the test program to get this thing to space was gonna be what it was. And it is probably more complex than the design of the helicopter itself because we had to prove that we were worthy enough to fly on this flagship mission. We had to prove that we wouldn't fall apart on the day of the launch as the rocket's going up, you know, this thing breaks into a little bunch of pieces. That it's worthwhile for NASA to accept that we can fly all the way to Mars. So the test program was crazy. We had, we built a swing arm where we would swing the helicopter back and forth to mimic forward flight. We mounted the helicopter on a gimbal to sort of see how it would respond to various forces. Uh, we measured forces, we measured torques. Um, we did a whole bunch of tethered flights and free flights. Now, the tethered flights were interesting because many of these things, we had the whole helicopter suspended on a, on a tether with a knot because the Mars vehicle is too heavy to fly by itself here on Earth. 
The one that I showed you had all the computers and the power supply under the floor, so it was only 850 grams. That it can fly here by itself. But at 1.8 kilograms, it can't lift off on Earth's gravity. Mars gravity is about 40%, you know, what, what it is out here. So it's fine on Mars. But so we ever had to actually build a little gravity assist, a little fishing line that, you know, pull on it just to compensate for the gravity difference. Yeah. Trim, you know how many reviews it takes to get a knot approved because you literally have the whole program hanging on a thread, you know? <laughs> so we had um, the major part of something like this, the spacecraft, is the thermal balance. Like, we actually use most of our energy for surviving the night till two weeks ago where we gave up on that. Only about a third or a quarter of the energy is actually used for flying. Everything else is just to keep things warm. But to prove that you could survive the night and you know manage your thermostat controls and so on and so forth, so all the test program for that. I don't know if you folks realize it, but when a spacecraft you know, changes configuration, like the wheels get lowered, it's not some nice smooth little motor that's dropping things, it's basically explosives. They blow bolts and, and cable cutters. Pyrotechnic charges blow and separate things. So those pyrotechnic devices generate shock loads in the thousands of Gs. And those shock vibrations propagate through the entire spacecraft. Now here you have this delicate gossamer thing with these delicate wings and stuff. You have to survive all of that. So there's a test program to say that we survive all of pyroshock. Not normally something an aircraft program, test program worries about. Uh, vibration tables, if there are the equivalent during liftoff uh, because of the huge acoustic vibrations on the spacecraft, there's the equivalent of about 80 G vibrational loads. So all the pieces have to be designed to like an 80 G kind of load. And so, you, but you have to prove that you actually survived it. So we were on vibe tables. Um, again, as I said, we have to be a good stowaway, a good passenger. We can't be in a situation where we are causing some electrical noise to the rest of the rover. Or when we operate our radio, we're interfering with an instrument. So there's a whole test program on electromagnetic interference, conductive and radiated EMI, EMC, plus structural tests. Are we strong enough to survive? So in many ways, the test program is more complex than the design of a helicopter. One particular example, we wanted to test the performance of this helicopter in wind. So we said like, okay, we need a wind tunnel. We'll spin up the blades, but we want a wind tunnel with, you know, 10 meters per second wind, 30 feet per second wind. We wanted to test at those conditions. Turns out that there is no wind tunnel in the country which can give you that low speeds, you know, 10, 20 meters per second, and also at low density. The folks at NASA Langley said, well, we have something that we can kind of jury rig something and maybe get it working. Finally, time was running short, so I had to decide, yes, we had to build our own wind tunnel. Okay. So we used 960 computer fans, <laughs> all in a big array. So those are the, you can see the, the, the fans out there. Now this is what's known as an open section wind tunnel. We don't have the baffles. It turns out that you don't need the baffles. If you, you can just run all these fans and in the sweet spot where you have the test article, you know, you can blow the wind. Um, so these 960 fans had to be powered on. It sounded like a jet engine taking off, you can imagine. And they all had to be, you know, rework to make sure that they didn't emit any gases because we didn't want to contaminate the chamber. When, once you pump things down in vacuum, you know, there's a lot of goo that tends to evaporate and settle on surfaces. So there's contamination control issues and everything. But that's the test article, the helicopter. You notice it's upside down. And the reason we keep it upside down is that uh, the airflow, there's more room for the airflow towards the top. And so the less interference with, uh, you know, self-interference with all the airflow. So we tend to do a lot, many of our tests, uh, fixed tests with it upside down. So there you go, uh, a wind tunnel that had to be invented that nobody, you know, thought of in the beginning of the program. Okay, so we, I told you we are on a flagship mission. So all our interfaces to the rover are very high quality, so-called class A standards. Um, 
we are extremely clean. We are on an astrobiological mission, and so we don't want to take spores of stuff there and get people confused as to whether it's Earth life that we're detecting or um, you know, Martian life. So this is one of the cleanest pieces of hardware. Things have to be scrubbed and clean and assays. We are turned out to be extremely low spore count. Um, and there's this pesky lithium ion batteries that we're carrying. And we're probably familiar with lithium ion always being this thing, you know, the airlines and what are you carrying? And for good reason. If you don't treat them right, they will catch fire. They are nasty from that perspective. So how do you prove and how do you have design this robust to make sure that your batteries are safe? Um, an accommodation and deployment, okay. Well, we have to get on the rover, right? Uh, so we're nestled you know, on the belly of the rover. So it's kind of like the rover gives birth to the helicopter. It kind of has that kind of feel to it. And you, know, you look at it and say, oh yeah, there it is. You, know, um, you see that area, it's, it's mounted sideways. Now, normally there's this thing called a debris shield that looks like a big guitar case that encapsulates that because when the rover lands and it's firing its rocket engines from the sky crane, there's a lot of dirt and pebbles and stuff that gets kicked up. And uh, so there's this debris shield that protects you know, the system, but the debris shield is not on in this picture. And you say like, oh, okay, that's um, you know, cool. Like that's where you ended up, fine, no problem. But there's a whole story to it. Our initial concept was to have it actually in that location with the blades folded, what I call as a helicopter in a crate. And then I remember I told you that the project was really not very happy with us. We were the stowaway that NASA wanted, but you know, they like, oh. So they tried to get us to move to a different place. We ended up in various nooks and crannies. We looked at designs in what I would call as the armpit of the rover. And we explored a whole bunch of designs, a sliding design, a robot arm that would take us out, a shoe box that they would drop on the ground and we would self-deploy. Fine. Anyway, finally, after all of that, they said, okay, you know what? I guess you're here to stay. Let's put you back on the bottom of the rover. And let's also make it a little bit easier for you so that you don't have to fold um, your wings because fold, folding means you've got to unfold them on Mars, right? So there's complexity. So that actually gave us you know, enough room that we could fly with an unfolded system. And that's the gadget that Lockheed Martin built to actually drop us onto the surface. Um, everything is built like a spacecraft. Uh, all our parts are radiation screen, temperature screen. Um, I, we followed all the flight processes with some, we were given some latitude in terms of how we could build this stuff. So we took advantage of these things. All the materials are spacecraft approved materials. Um, I mentioned the carbon dioxide gas cap. Um, there are multiple internal radiation baffles to keep us from fighting the cold. We have a very specialized uh, coating on this uh, helicopter, which is essentially lets the helicopter behave like a, your garden lizard. In the morning, it's a very high alpha coating which absorbs sunlight and warms up the innards of the helicopter. And, and, it's, and it's got a low epsilon emissivity at night, so it doesn't cool off. So that actually behaves exactly like a reptile skin. You know, It sort of absorbs heat. So we don't have to use heaters to warm up in the morning. We let the sun do the warming. So there's a very high custom coating for, for doing that. We have a closed loop control that's run by a thermostat. And most of energy, um, you know, till very recently was going into trying to stay warm through the night. We have given up on that for the last two weeks and we'll probably be in that mode till the end of September. All our parts are getting a lot more stressed because they're going down to minus 90 degrees centigrade every night as opposed to just going down to minus 20 or minus 30. But so far, two weeks, everything's been working. So we are hopeful that we'll survive till uh, September and then we come out of Martian winter and we start climbing out the warm side again. So that's sort of the story of the design story in a nutshell. So now let's look at you know, some of our flights, uh, what I call as uh, postcards from a trip. So first was, we got dropped off at Wright Brothers Field, which is the area that was named after the Wright Brothers. So the way we got there is uh, we were on, you know, the, the right at the very tip of that rocket is Perseverance, the, the 
which just below the heat shield is, is uh, Ingenuity. So we actually are the very first thing that goes off you know, into space. Uh, we landed on Mars with the sky crane. Some of you must have seen that. I'm not going to. And Ingenuity is there, you know, down at the bottom in this guitar case. You know, uh, this is a visualization. Um, during those six months, every two weeks, we just touch, you know, touch the battery a little bit to keep the charge up to a reasonable level. Um, and then we landed. And so the question was, where did we land? Because the very first thing we wanted to do was to find a airfield that would support our what was then just a 30-day flight. So we had a team that was looking for places that were good airfields and good flight zones. And the reason thinking was, hey, this is just a tech demo. Let's find a flat spot so we don't have to have the complexity of a navigation system that can handle hills and hillocks and bumps and craters. Let's find a flat spot, do our flights and be done with it. So what we needed was low slopes, a few obstacles so that when we landed, we don't have what's called hazard avoidance on this uh, system. So we don't actively look for a rock when we are landing and try to avoid it. We just land. And it, has, it should also have enough visual features. Because as I said, we're taking 30 images every second. For example, on a texture like this where everything looks bland, it's difficult to tell how much you're moved because every piece looks the same as the other. So you wanted to make sure that we didn't have bland features or otherwise our visual, visual tracking would fail. So we found a bunch of candidate airfields. Um, and in the, the, for the very first one, we did, you know, we did a lot of rock counting. You know? So in that little patch, Wright Brothers Field, which is blown up here on the right, we counted all the rocks, you know, made sure that we thought it was a perfectly good safe region. And we had a flight zone that we were going to fly back and forth. Oh, that was it. And uh, we deployed the the debris shield, we got rid of that. And then we deployed to the surface. And this, is, this actually took place over multiple days. And every day, the rover would peek into under its belly and take a picture to make sure everything was right. <laughs> and uh, that's a very complicated sequence uh, of pyrotechnic devices and uh, explosive cutters and funny things called frangibles, and all kinds of very interesting little gadgets that uh, basically let that happen. And then we were there on the surface. And we did uh, some commissioning. We had kept the blades locked through the entire cruise so because we didn't want them to be rattling around. So we first had to do a blade release maneuver. That's why this, the, both the blades are going in the same direction to do this release. When we fly, we actually fly the blades in a counter-rotating direction so we don't get a net torque that would, you know, we don't need a tail rotor with this kind of design. And then we did a low-speed spin and also a high-speed spin. And during those 30 days, because the, there was a dedicated 30 days that the rover was supporting us, they had some really nice cameras with video capability, and they were taking all these nice pictures of us. And that culminated in the first flight. And uh, Otto Lilenthal, who was sort of an inspiration to the Wright brothers, uh, and I fully resonate with this, uh, to invent an airplane is nothing, OK? To build one is something. But to fly is everything. So we did the invention. We did the build. And um, at the JPL Operations Center, we did that first flight. We took off, did a turn at three meters above the ground. It's about 10 feet, about 40 seconds of total flight time. And we sent back one image. Now you know why that's my favorite image. It's the, it's the image from that flight. All the other stuff, you know, the color stuff is gravy. but. Uh, um, and if you ever get the chance to see the videos of this on YouTube, watch my project manager who's on the left, uh, Mimi Wong, literally fly out of her chair a few times. And uh, if you ever get a chance to um, meet Mimi, you should. Uh, she's working for Amazon right now, but uh, she was. <laughs> and our uh, chief pilot, basically our guidance, navigation, and control lead, said, I, I don't want to, I'm only going to be convinced we flew if I look at the altimeter plot. So there is the altimeter plot where you can see, you know, this whole study, and then it goes up to three meters, that, and then it comes down. So that's when he declared the first flight a success, OK? And uh, this video is sped up by about a factor of three. But this is the first flight as captured by the rover on Mars. So basically, all the stuff you saw in the chamber now, 
It's interesting, on subsequent flights, there's a microphone system on the rover, and they actually recorded a lot of the sounds. And they actually were able to do some very interesting science with, with that sound, unexpected science. And actually, there's a paper in Nature uh, which has you know, some of the results, and there's some peculiarities about speed of sound on Mars that uh, turned out that, uh, so that's, that's first flight on Mars. More flights going to new places. I'll pick a few. There are 28 now, so it's kind of like a long list. Um, flight four, we went pretty far. Uh, we mapped a whole bunch of terrain. And you can see this is the ground swath of that navigation camera. If you project it on the ground, you can see what the helicopter is seeing. And this is the one where uh, the microphone was used. So here you have the system. So you actually get to hear the Doppler and everything, you know, the, you know, the, the railroad train effect where it's coming, you get the increase in pitch, you get all of that, and, and there's, that's when we really started beginning to spread our wings. We were supposed to fly, three flights was the baseline, we had two as a contingency, or for if first three went well, we'd do something more. This is the point where the scientists and everybody started waking up and saying, hey, this thing may actually be useful. Uh, we kind of not liked it so far, but maybe we, we like it. So for example, on flight number 10, we did a reconnaissance mission into SETA, and we made this place called Mount Rochefort, and it looked interesting from those orbital images I was showing you, okay? But when they saw these images, I said, you know, it really isn't as interesting as we thought it did from orbit, so let's not bother sending the rover there, but let's send it to a more important science target. So we actually saved them some time. Um, flight 12, there were certain targets that the rovers wanted to sample. They used user imagery, and these are scientists, you know, in their planning meetings, saying, hmm, okay, maybe we need to sample that one and that one. So this is where having a forward scout that goes out there, looks at things, and helps you plan your science mission, help, helps you plan your rover routes so that you don't get stuck in a sand dune. So all of those kinds of things have turned out to be extremely useful. And as I said, mentioned complementary science, I mentioned about the sound. This is the one where the fact that we kicked up dust, which is enhanced, um, actually gave some new insight into dust transport in the Martian atmosphere because we're actively generating a little tornado of wind and so it's not just a random dust devil going around the landscape, but you're actually doing it, and so they got some interesting uh, information from that. So where are we with Ingenuity right now? We completed this tech demo, and we were then transitioned because of our uh, success into what's called a operations demo. Let's learn how to use this aerial asset together with a rover asset. Let's learn how to do science with it in a scouting sense. So there's this whole region of Mars called Zeta, which we just finished exploring together with the rover. So that ops campaign has been completed. We are 380, 390 days on Mars. Each day on Mars is called a soul. It's slightly over a day on Earth, 24 and a half hours roughly. We did perfectly well through spring and summer, and we are surviving winter, but uh, we, if all goes well, actually, we'll be doing a 29th flight in about a week or two. So even though it's a winter flight, and even though we come up from dead cold, frozen battery in the night, we are hoping to fly in the afternoon. Um, so what I, I'm calling it ongoing winter survival operations. Uh, 28 flights done. Uh, we have flown about seven kilometers and almost an hour, almost an hour of flight time on Mars. Uh, those black and white images, not. We take 30 of them in a second, but we only send back you know, every image from every three seconds or five seconds. We send back over 3,500 uh, navigation images and about 140 color images, like the one I showed you on that first slide. We have updated the software twice, and actually we're in the process of another software update coming up. And we actually had a big dust storm in February, which piled a lot of dirt on top of us and just kind of cut down our solar panel production during the dust storm, and we have survived that. And uh, this is kind of where we are. We, the green line, um, all right, I'm gonna, not that it would have cured itself, but let's try. No, okay. <laughs> we started off somewhere on the top, middle right. We worked our way down. 
We did this epic flight across that peninsula-like thing. That's a whole bunch of sand dunes. That's a region that the rover cannot drive. The rover actually the white path. They actually to drive all the way around. We were able to cut across, do all the forward scouting, and then we came back, and the rover then raced back all the way around because they want to get to the river delta. That's the place where the most interesting sediments would be, which could ha harbor signs of past life on Mars. So they're going to be doing a bunch of stuff out there. We have basically took our shortcuts, and you know, since we're a flying vehicle, and we are parked right there where that end of that green dot near the river delta is. Uh, we probably won't be doing a whole lot of flights till winter is over on the September time frame. But then the plan is we will have a software update so that we don't have to worry about this flat ground thing. We have been working around this flat ground constraint that we built in long time ago, but we are going to update the system so that we actually have a, a good navigation even on bumpy, hilly terrain. And then if we are still alive, we are going to go and scout and explore the Delta region for the rover so that they can go and find useful, interesting things to do there. So what's that for the Ingenuity team? Um, we got on a tremendous amount of data. Needless to say, uh, there's a tremendous insight into what it takes to build an aerial vehicle on Mars. And there are a couple of ideas in the uh, it works. One of them is uh, what would be the future helicopters on Mars. Uh, there's interesting work going on on defining a science helicopter, which would be about 30 kilograms, about 60, 70 pounds, with maybe about five kilograms, 10 pounds of science payloads. Um, there's some other interesting helicopter projects, which uh, might be also in the works, uh, which uh, you might hear about in the next few weeks and months. So we'll see. Nothing's been funded yet, or nothing's been, you know, finally approved, but uh, I'm pretty sure this won't be the, the last of the helicopters on Mars. So with that, uh, I want to leave with a couple of things. This is all the, the other inspiration, you know, Da Vinci's uh, famous uh, thing. So there's a bit of a that coaxial resemblance. And this is what uh, Da Vinci said about, uh, you know, it will make uh, the first flight this great bird filling the universe with awe filling all writings with its fame and eternal glory to the nest where it was born. So I think we kind of did some of that. So we're very happy as a team. So uh, I think that's my formal talk. I'll take questions. So we have time for questions. I'll read one comment for Cameo before we start the Q&A. Cameo John Randall says, of the minutes that you read, a very nice summary, and he thanks you. Please stand and tell us your name and if you're a member. I'm Frederica Darima, and I'm a member. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Congratulations to NASA, to you and to your team for your achievement. I have many questions, but Larry only asks us to, uh, allows us to ask only one, two. one two. Two, two. So uh, first of all, as an observation, my, Mars seems to be very mild, tame, compared to the moon surface, it looked like. But uh, my question is, uh, um, why you choose a helicopter rotor versus a thruster, first of all? And the the current system you have, what is the expected lifetime? Okay, so I, I have looked at in the past at uh, balloon type systems. Um, and so if you think of a blimp versus a helicopter first, you know, you, you get into the, I think a helicopter is inherently much more precisely controllable and can get up close, hover, uh, so on and so forth. But not to say that a blimp system cannot be built. Uh, there are problems with inflation uh, of blimps and so forth. So when it comes to balloons and rotorcraft, you know, I think there is an advantage to rotorcraft, though I do believe a balloon blimp type systems can also be successfully deployed on Mars. It just requires engineering to do that. Regarding thrusters versus something like this, um, this is a green vehicle. I guess on Mars you would say it's a red vehicle. Uh, it's, a, it's solar powered. It's completely replenished. There is absolutely no consumable. And of course, we didn't design it to 
fly through, last through winter, but it seems to be doing okay. But you could argue that there is, uh, fundamentally, there's nothing life-limiting on this vehicle. We have dampers in our landing gear uh, where we actually like yield aluminum metal to provide the damping. And our understanding is maybe after 200 landings or so, the, the yield capability of that metal is gonna drop and uh, we won't, won't get the damping we necessarily would like to see. But that's the only life-limiting item on this entire system. And so it you know, replenishes itself every time the sun shines on it, which, uh, and it doesn't have a lot of the complexity of a cluster propulsion system that would, you would, you know, would be of more limited duration use. That's kind of my sort of summary of the pros and cons of this stuff. But not to say that those other systems don't have roles. Uh, people have talked about hopper, propulsive hoppers, and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, I, was, I would like to see the day on Mars when we have uh, dozens of these kinds of things uh, at play, so. You mentioned dust uh, being created. So dust, in a sense, uh, impacts the integrity of the routers eventually. So in that respect, I ask, that's why I asked what is the uh, expected. The, the <laughs> dust that I talked about was during the landing event. There is a violent rocket plumes from the landing system that was kicking up the stuff. Okay. The day-to-day -day dust is not really damaging the rotors. We have seals, sealing mechanisms on all the critical mechanisms. And the actual impact of the dust on the uh, rotor blades, even at the high speed spins, is the dust particles are very small and the material is, of the blades is quite strong. So we haven't seen anything obvious in terms of degradation. Uh, but then again, we weren't looking for it since we were only supposed to be a 30-day mission. So I don't think that's necessarily a, a big issue. I think the, it's a materials issue, which is fairly straightforward, I think. The red microphone, please stand. Tell us your name and if you're a member. Okay, my name is uh, Colin Elberts, and I am a member. Um, I was also going to ask about uh, dirigibles or aerostats, but I think that sounds a little bit too science fiction-y because you know, all science fiction has to have zeppelins. But um, <laughs> I will ask this question, though, um, and I don't mean by asking it to take away from what I think is really one of the most remarkable achievements so far this century, actually. But given what you, given all of the, uh, given the effort in putting this together and making sure it would work, and then actually seeing it work and putting it through its paces and getting an hour's worth of flight time. Um, from what you've learned from its performance, is there anything you wish you had done differently? Um, is there anything that you say, oh, we could have, you know, we could have accomplished something different if we had just done something now that we know that, uh, now we know, now that we know it can be done? Well, there are a number of individual areas of technology that can be improved. Um, and so for the next generation of systems, I think we'll be incorporating many of these things. But, um, uh, you know, I, I liken the process of this helicopter effort as walking through a maze. And it wasn't clear that there was a path out of the maze, right? But using physics and having a great team behind us and having a great project manager who would, you know, not let any obstacles stand in our way, programmatic money and all those kinds of things, we were able to get through. So it really wasn't on my radar to be sitting and thinking, you know, what are the better versions of this helicopter. I think it's very mission specific. So if you give a particular mission and a particular role, I think we understand enough of the design to build a helicopter that is tailored to that particular role, okay? And whether that role is a science mission with a 30 kilogram helicopter or whether it's some kind of other mission with something similar to Ingenuity, it just really is a function of the role you assign it. And then I think we have all the knowledge now to build it so that it optimally meets that role. So Ingenuity by itself, a um, couple of small examples. My project manager fought me on having a color camera on this because at one time, the scientists were up in arms against this. You're saying, oh, you're, pretend, you're masquerading as a tech demo, but you're really trying to be a science instrument because you know it was part of one of their, and so one of her ways she was countering that was to say like, hey, you know, we do, we're not even going to have a color camera, you know? So this is just, but in the project, we fought her and we, uh, you know. Um, so there are certain things that we did, which in hindsight were perfectly good things to do. Uh, 
like have a color camera, even if it's an engineering tech demo, have a color camera. In fact, I honestly think that we should have gadgets like this all over the solar system with color cameras. Forget the science. Scientists can catch up afterwards just to do cool stuff, right? <laughs> Why don't we have 100 uh, images from different parts of the solar system, you know, coming back and exciting our people, right? Uh, so, yeah, we, I think we will tailor whatever we need, but I don't see anything different that I would have done on Ingenuity necessarily. It was just enough to get to the finishing line. Okay, Bob. Red mic. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Uh, what are you doing to monitor it besides just watching it? Does it have devices to see its condition? Right. So we get, uh, we get telemetry on a pretty frequent basis. Um, depending upon the rover schedule. Um, we are now part, folded in as part of the rover mission, so we're not treated anything special like we were in those first 30 days. So typically our flight cadence can be about once in two weeks. Sometimes it speeds up, sometimes it slows down. And depending upon what their operational constraints and windows are, we are, can talk to the helicopter, okay? So when we do talk to the helicopter, we get telemetry, which gives us all the temperatures of all the gadgets that are there. We get the battery state of charge. We see how much solar current is coming. We see how well the radio power, the radiated power from the radius is. So we get a lot of data that then we can go back to our models and say, you know, are, are our models over predicting or under predicting? And we fine tune the models going forward. So there is a wealth of um, engineering telemetry that comes back completely independent of flying. Now, once we are actually in the air and flying, we get very high rate data on how did the actuators perform, how did the, rover, the rotorcraft swash plate move, you know, what kind of uh, uh, control effort was it uh, requiring to fly through the winds, everything. We get all of that during a, from an actual flight. After we land, we get all of the data. OK, we got a, a few questions here. I'm going to read one from. Uh... Uh, from the Zoom, and then we're going to go to the blue microphone, and then we're going to go to YouTube with the gray microphone, and then we'll come back to the red microphone up here, and then the red microphone will come over here, just so you know. Okay, so we got a, a little helicopter on Mars kind of plan laid out here. <laughs> so uh, the question from the web is from David Rabinowitz, who is a member, a longtime member, and he asks, how do you implement flight controls? Cyclic, relative rotor, rotor speeds, something else? Right. No, we, are, we have a, both a collective and a cyclic on both the upper rotor and the lower rotor. And that actually gives us a pretty good control authority. We could have had just a collective on the top rotor, but we chose to have a cyclic on, on both. Uh, both the rotors are operating at the same RPM where the RPM is selected based upon flight density conditions. It's to optimize the thrust characteristics as a function of RPM. So we don't modulate the, the rotor velocities during flight. We only modulate the heave control, which is the up-down control with the collectives. And the cyclics basically provided the uh, pitching and you know, uh, rolling uh, control. And once you can pitch and roll the vehicle, then it leans, and then it, basically you get translational flight that way. So it's constant RPM on both uh, rotors. You might explain what cyclic is for some uh, of us. It's, it's a difficult thing to explain in a short stuff, but basically um, as the rotor goes around, the blade angle is changed just a little bit by a mechanism, and it changes it once per revolution. Basically, it pitches up in the front, pitches down on the side and pitches again. And what that does is that cyclic modulation of the blade pitch produces the wake, a net tilt. It's a gyroscopic effect, effectively. And that's the way all helicopters work. They basically modulate the pitch angle in a once per rotation way. And a swash plate is a mechanism whereby you take your control actions and you make that modulation happen. And it's a complex little mechanical gadget, but uh, which you can go on YouTube or in elsewhere and look at animations and see how it works. Well, I think that was a commendably clear, concise explanation. Thank you. I want to see it in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I think we have uh, the blue microphone number two there. Is that correct? Hi, uh, Robert Thompson. I am a member. I was just curious about some of the basic stats. Um, you know, what is the maximum, in principle, what's the maximum flight duration and the maximum altitude it could achieve and okay. the recharge time? Yeah, so the, um, when we went into this, we thought we could fly uh, maybe at most 90 seconds. Uh, we're really constrained by thermal limits on the motor. Remember I told you that this motor, we're not actively trying to dissipate the heat away from the motor, we're absorbing it into the motor housing. So there are certain adhesives in the motor which hold the magnets and stuff in place. We don't want to get you know, uh, into the glass transition temperatures and things of those adhesives. So that sets a fundamental limit on how long we can run the motor before it overheats. And so the 90 seconds was what we went in with, but we are now pretty comfortable almost hitting three minutes on these motors. Future helicopters that we're designing have flight times in the 15 minute type of range. So, but this particular one, uh, three minutes is probably the maximum that we would do because then we would worry about losing structural integrity inside that motor. Um, regarding the height, we are constrained by this um, altimeter that we bought from SparkFun. You know, that's just a, you know, I was talking about open source, it's a hobby place. Uh, it turns out that it's a, it's a Garmin LiDAR unit, but uh, the data is very reliable to about 10, 15 meters. Um, and it starts dropping out after that intermittently, and at about 40 meters and above, it would probably not work very well. So right now we've been restricting our flights to within the, you know, less than 10 meters. But we have the ability to probably go up to 20, 30 uh, without worrying about it too much. But we haven't found a need to do it. There is a certain sweet spot from a science observation perspective that's in the 8, 9, 12 meter range, which seems to be adequate. Um, flying higher would allow us to go faster because we could cover more ground in our navigation images. Uh, we're depending upon frame to frame overlap to see how much we're moved. And if you're too close to the ground, the frames go by too quickly. So if you fly up higher, you know, you can afford to go faster. Um, so yeah, so, so tw 20 meters, 30 meters, maybe tops, and three minutes. Question from YouTube with the gray microphone. Joel, who is a member of the society, asks, you said that helicopter specialists had to solve new problems to get this aircraft to fly. Did those solutions influence helicopter design here on Earth? Did you repeat that? Yep. You said that helicopter specialists had to solve new problems to get this aircraft to fly. Did those solutions influence helicopter design here on Earth? And that question was from Joel, who's a member of the society. Right, so specifically about the flying in these thin atmosphere conditions, I don't think there's a very direct relevance. Um, there are some high altitude aircraft designs, which uh, Air Environment, for example, is continuing to work on, which I think are benefiting from a little bit on some of the, the uh, technology related to the actual aerodynamic performance. But I think the other experience base, which the uh, NASA community, there's a whole electric vertical takeoff and landing, VTOL technology, which are all primarily designed to be, you know, battery powered types of systems. So the fact that, you know, to some level you can think about that this is pretty much state of the art in a lot of uh, autonomy technology uh, may have some, you know, good benefits in adapting these electric VTOL aircraft for you know, urban use, terrestrial use. Uh, I think that the dream is that instead of getting an Uber that gets on the ground, you, you know, it shows up on your doorstep and then takes you to, flies you to the next destination. And that's kind of coming down the pipe is from my understanding in the next you know, five, 10 years. Urban so, air mobility. Do we have the red microphone up here because I, oh yes, you're next. And then, and then, so red, red, and then blue. Bryce Eldridge and I am a member. You obviously did a lot of simulation as well as some of the many more tests than the one we saw, the few that we saw. As you got data back, have you had any surprises? I, things you simulated one way and things differently, what, what happened? So we, there is a um, physics-based simulation that we used extensively, which uh, I think when you're reading my bio, 
you know, you mentioned some of this other. So there's a pr simulation framework that was developed at JPL. It's also in use at JSC and a couple of other places, which is a physics-based multi-body simulation framework, which is was the heart of um, a lot of the work that was done here. It allows you to not only simulate the physics of the vehicle, but all the devices, the cameras, the imaging, the altimeter, and so forth. So it turns out that the simulations have been actually pretty much dead on. And you know, it's one of the reasons why we were able to sort of open up the flight envelope is that, uh, in fact, my chief pilot uh, only half jokingly said that when he first saw some telemetry from one of these things, he said like, did I by accident ingest a simulation run and you know, get the game? Am I look so things are looking very clean and very predictable. So that is a major boost in terms of us extrapolating to other designs that the physics models have held up very well. Um, and so that's, that's been a, 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 a nice, pleasant surprise. It could have been the other way around where there could have been a cliff, if you will, and you only trust the physics models up to here. And after that, there's some unmodeled thing that you don't know about. Um, we had one flight, I believe it was flight six, where we had an anomaly. We, one of those navigation images I told you about that we take, um, one of them got dropped and all the subsequent ones got a bad timestamp. So it could totally confuse a navigation system because it, it's looking at the timestamp to see how much it has moved and the timestamps were wrong. So the vehicle actually went kind of unstable. It did a lot of wild excursions. Luckily it had enough uh, stability margins to power its way through and land successfully. But we actually exercise portions of a flight envelope that we would normally never have sent the helicopter to because you normally don't want it to pitch up like crazy and so on and so forth, right? You wouldn't deliberately do that. But we kind of got it for free. And again, so the, um, the performance has been great. Uh, that's one of our flight software fixes was to fix that uh, software bug we found in the imaging system. So yeah, it's, it's, it's held up uh, pretty good, yeah, in terms of simulations versus reality. I'd be careful about letting that out onto the web because people will start saying it was all just really a simulation. <laughs> like the moon landing. Of course. It's the same, it's, it's the same back lot in Burbank uh, where we do all of this. <laughs> uh, red microphone in the front row. Stand up, tell us your name if you're a member, and ask I am, your question. I am Tom Erickson. I am a member. And uh, now that you have the scientists excited about the advantages of low altitude reconnaissance, what are they going to ask you to design for the next Mars mission? Um, th there's stuff in the works uh, that I can't comment on anything, but this, stay tuned. <laughs> oh, come on, give us a hint. Well, let me, there's a whole spectrum of scientific missions and there's a whole spectrum of other engineering missions, all related to Mars where we can be useful. Um, I guess it's worth noting that there is a high altitude uh, imaging system of circulating, cir circling Mars, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that's yeah, been, the been up there for a long time and it's really so, allowed all of these uh, other there, missions. There, there are engineering uses uh, for this system and there are science uses for this system and both are being actively looked at in the study phase. Um, so depending upon, you know, the powers that be, you know, I think certain things might get approved in the certain time frame. Um, the reason I don't want to comment upon it in any more detail is uh, some of it is competition sensitive, like things like discovery proposals and stuff like that, which are uh, competed uh, types of things, and other things are just a lot of programmatic sensitivities which need to be worked through before yeah, anything is formally announced. Understand. But I was... there's, there's this, I'm pretty sure this won't be the last one. Let's put it that way. I'm going to sneak a question in here. I think MRO is nearing the end of its life. Is there a plan afoot to replace it with another orbiter? Yeah, but that is still or that is still planetary scale imaging, right? All of what we are talking about no, is no, 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 not as a substitute. Just yeah. as a question about Mars yeah. uh, exploration. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know the exact replacement plan for various orbiters and stuff like that. Um, by the way, you're mentioning about terrain on. The reason that particular terrain looks somewhat benign is it happens to be in a lake, lake bed of Mars, right? So other parts of Mars may not look that, you know, benign. So this was a lake, lake bottom. So 
So we have the blue microphone, Tim Thomas. Some Tim Thomas from. Wait, the wait, wait, wait till it's on. There you go. Give it time. Okay. Um, my question I'm curious about is if while you're flying, the rover should be obliterated by a meteorite or a space laser, <laughs> would you be able to land, take off again, and photograph the wreckage? Okay. <laughs> the answer no, because the radio on this helicopter is the same radio that is, uh, you use to control your home sprinkler, your home gardening system, you know, your to turn your water sprinklers on and off. It's called a Zigbee protocol, small chipsets. So the, there's a companion radio that is bolted onto a box that sits on the rover. So we send our data from the helicopter to the box on the rover, up to about a kilometer, kilometer and a half, depending upon terrain. Um, and then the rover then takes the trouble of getting the data to an orbiting satellite or directly to Earth, but usually to an orbiting satellite. And then the orbiting satellites send it back to the deep space network. So we don't have enough radio power or the technology from this small helicopter uh, where the radio was you know, a few grams to actually talk anything to anything more than a kilometer or so. So if the rover disappears, there is no relay station to, to, to send, send up. No, we would land. We are not depending upon a continuous link during flight. So we would proceed with our commanded flight. We would land. And then the data transmissions that we would do you know, after landing or during flight, we actually send back a certain amount of minimal telemetry. There would be nobody listening to it on the receiving side. And so we would just finish our transmissions. They wouldn't get captured. And then we would just sit there, waking up every day you know, at a predetermined time to listen to a command, and there would be no command coming in. Um, so that would be the end of, uh, so we would still be perhaps be operational, listening every day, but there's nobody to, you know, tell us what to do. Tim, Tim, you need the microphone. You can't have a conversation that nobody can hear except you. Blue microphone. I just I just thought of something else. Um, about three and a half years ago, we had a speaker here, uh, uh, Dr. Z.B. Turtle, who was describing the Dragonfly, Dragonfly project. Right. Um, and at that point, it had not yet been approved, but since then, of course, it has. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, has there been any sort of cross-collaboration between your team and, uh, and hers about this, or any lessons learned, or are flying conditions on Titan just so radically different from those on Mars that it really, there's nothing to talk about. Right, so there's two various levels of that conversation. Purely from a physics vehicle design perspective, there's probably not a lot because Titan is the easiest place in the solar system to fly. You could put on a, a couple of wings and you would fly in Titan if you didn't mind the cold. That, it's that easy to fly. The gravity is low, the, the, the atmosphere is really thick. But what we bring in terms of the operational experience, the lessons learned there, what we bring in terms of a verification and validation program, the test programs, in terms of how do we test it. So there is plans to you know, um, have many of our team members participate perhaps in review board meetings and so on and so forth. And there have been a lot of informal meetings even otherwise with people like Ralph Lawrence who is uh, you know, on uh, the, the Dragonfly team, you know, have had conversations about various uh, things. And recently, the, the Solar System Exploration Director at JPL, Bobby Brown, he's gone to Applied Physics Lab as the head of the space uh, division. So he's intimately familiar with everything that we did. And so I think I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, he will call upon us to, for lessons learned, review boards, test program reviews, uh, test design, test philosophies. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of the success in these missions comes down to how you navigate through the infinite number of tests that one could do, and you only have resources to do so much, right? So what is important, what is not, uh, plus the ops experience, you know, how do we, the command cadence, this, that, that, the many things. So yes, there is cross-fertilization, and it'll be, it'll probably pick up even more as they move ahead. Is there a question over there? Great microphone. Hold on a second while we... Get the pot up, all right. Phone? 
All right. Uh, hi, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm not a member. Um, this is maybe a little off topic, but since you worked in EDL, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, the gap between what we have experienced landing on Mars and what we would need to land for a human mission. You know, this is a, a few tons, I think, and, you know, human yeah. mission would be huge. So, sort of the summary thing is that uh, we have used uh, essentially like ballistic entries with uh, very low lift to drag type of characteristics. In other words, by changing the CG and controlling the attitude, we had, let, let us have loft a bit and land, and we can bleed off sufficient energy during uh, that process and also achieve a certain precision in landing. Uh, for heavier payloads, uh, to bleed the energy off requires a higher lift over drag, more lifting body type of designs. And folks at NASA Langley, I think, have been working on those kinds of uh, lifting body shapes and stuff. So directly, I think, uh, in terms of you know the payload that you can land with a conventional ballistic entry, 70 degree half cones, you know, uh, type of uh, aeroshells, we're probably at the limit here. And anything bigger would be a mid L over D, mid lift, lift over drag uh, vehicle designs. Just to a, a quick follow up. Um, yeah, it, that's. Uh, that's a really that's one interesting difference. Um, I, I was wondering if you if you think we would have to tr if we're ba if we'll be able to go straight to you know human sized lander, if maybe we need experience with something a little bit in between. Uh, I haven't really studied the problem carefully. Uh, Mars is one of those pesky places where there's just enough atmosphere to be a nuisance, but not enough to slow things down. Okay, so it's not the moon. It's not Earth, and it's in this pesky in-between ground, which makes a lot of these designs uh, harder. So at the end of the day, it's, you have to be specific about what you're trying to land where, with what accuracy, what payload, what season, and then the design will emerge. And I haven't really worked that problem, so I'm really, I just gave you my sense of what I've seen other people working that problem, what they've been saying. But I've really not been in touch with much of the ideal literature in the last uh, six, seven years. Some, some other project took up a lot of my time in, in those last few years. So. We have the blue microphone. Hi, my name, hello. Hi, my name is Brett Magrum. I'm a member. Um, you talked a lot about trying to keep the, the helicopter warm. I was curious, if did you ever explore maybe using some radioactive isotopes to generate heat on there? And then yeah. my second question. Well, let me take one at a time because okay. yeah, otherwise I'll forget your first. Uh, we did consider at one point what's known as radioactive heating units, RHUs, which provide about one watt of heating power, which is pretty good. Uh, but there are the two issues there. One is the smallest chunk they come in through the Department of Energy, et cetera, is I think about a 50 gram piece of chunk of stuff. Um, the Sojourner rover that you know was the precursor to rovers on Mars had, I think, three RHUs uh, in it. Uh, we can't afford 50 grams of mass, at least we couldn't. And there is a whole, um, you know, uh, regulatory protocol approval process and so forth. So we ended up with a design. It was a major challenge that, you know, at least during the spring months, with our all our cleverness on baffles and CO2 gas caps and special coatings and heaters, we were able to be perfectly OK making the energy budget close and still having enough to fly. It's only in winter that we have run into problems. And that was just because we never designed for winter. And uh, my, my second question, too, was uh, what's the uh, center of gravity of, this, of the helicopter? And did you have any problems with it being too high or too low to make it fly you know, it's, well? Yeah, so we. It's just slightly below where the second row, the lower rotor is. That's where the uh, center of gravity is. Um, no, it's just something that we measure accurately. We measure the moments of inertia accurately, and it goes into the control law design. Uh, so it's inherently an unstable vehicle. So there's nothing, you know. That, so you do want to design the controller so that uh, you have adequate stability margins for that operating condition. But uh, there wasn't anything particularly you know, challenging in the sense of uh, 
being you know, extraordinarily unstable or something because of the CG. It just had to be something that you have to work with and design around. Red microphone. Give it a sec. One Mississippi. Okay. Excellent, thanks. Thanks for the talk, that was really great. My name is Cameo, I am a member. As you were mentioning, if you're trying to joystick something for navigation, you've got a 20 minute lag, and navigation is a really hard thing to do. Is this something that you also used as open source, or did you use some JPL software like AutoNav for navigation? There is a, um, a uh, algorithm that was, uh, uh, what was it called, Maven, which was developed at JPL for uh, small body navigation. So this is like if you're flying around an asteroid, how do you keep track of where you are? Um, so an adaptation of that was used for um, the system here. Now one thing I must say that there is a lot of stuff there in the robotics literature on something called SLAM, simultaneous uh, localization and mapping. Um, it's a very effective technology, but it's also quite complex in terms of its, its uh, coding requirements and testing requirements. And it, so the advantage, we lean towards having something that is very robust and reliable and from an algorithm perspective. And so we did not go with a SLAM solution, um, even though there's a lot of open source and other people have also worked on it. Um, so at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a pretty homegrown system, but it's using fairly standard technology. Um, but uh, it's, it was not, the, the open source stuff is in the operating system itself. And the fact that the flight software framework that we're using was developed at JPL and released as open source. So F prime, which is the flight software framework you're using is something that was developed at JPL a few years ago. And it's already flown in a few, few other small spacecraft. Um, uh, and then it's um, Asteria is one, and I think there's a bunch of uh, lunar missions that are gonna be using it. A helicopter was sort of the, one of the big ones that used it, but that's again, it's open source that we released um, in the open source uh, you know, community. But nothing specific on the vision side that's open source, not that I'm aware of. There may be some vision processing libraries that uh, we use that may be open source. Yeah, but I don't remember the details of which ones they are. Well, I think uh, we'll close the questions now. And, and before you go, I want to thank Bob for delivering the 91st Joseph Henry Lecture. I'm sure Joseph Henry and the founders of PSW would have been very interested in your work, and they would have found your talk fascinating and stimulating and probably would have had even more questions than we had tonight. So thank you again. And before you go, a small token of thanks, a signed copy of Volume 1 of the PSW Bulletin. Thank you explaining therein why the society was formed, who formed it, and why it was named the Philosophical Society of Washington, which word philosophical had a very different meaning than it does today. Some early reports on the meetings, including discussion of expeditions to view the transit of Mercury to measure the size of the solar system, the new monetary system in Japan, and a method to calculate pi to 30 decimal places. And we thank you again. Thank you. Pleasure. We'll catch up in a minute. And before everyone goes, we have a few closing remarks. Whoops, how did that happen? There we go. We're planning for the next meetings to be in person, but of course, that will be determined by COVID and COVID-related measures that are in place at the time. The next meeting, the 2,460th, will be on June 3rd. The speaker will be Charlie Tahan. He is the head of quantum computing at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and chief scientist at the Laboratory of Physical Sciences. He will be speaking about quantum computing in the National Quantum Computing Initiative. The 2,461st meeting will be on June 17th. The speaker will be Shabita Satyapal. She's a professor of physics and astronomy at George Mason University. And she will be speaking on supermassive black holes. And that will close the spring lecture series. 
The fall lecture series will begin with the 2,462nd meeting on September 9th. The speaker will be Drew Weissman of the University of Pennsylvania, and he will be speaking about mRNA vaccines, and in particular will tell us about the chemical modifications of RNAs that were required to make mRNAs that were both effective for producing proteins to induce an immune response and that would persist in the body despite the fact that the body would like to degrade the RNA. And that should be a very interesting talk. Please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information on meetings and whether lectures will be in person or just via Zoom. COVID and COVID-related public health measures are constantly changing and PSW is adjusting plans accordingly. Please join us for these meetings. Also, uh, please note a new feature on the website. You can subscribe to the PSW calendar for automatic updates to the schedule as they become available. Uh, just go to the website and click on the calendar icon, and uh, it will send you notifications that you can incorporate into your calendar as new lectures are posted. Last but not least, let's thank tonight's volunteers for producing this meeting. Robin Taylor, who's back there behind the screen that you don't see, who basically makes all of this stuff work. And when it doesn't work, it's because of those nasty electronic gremlins that creep into the system and screw things up even if you tested them 100 times ahead of time. I'd also like to thank Cameo Lance for preparing the minutes and reading them and uh, running the microphone. And Anne McQueen, our social media director, for running the YouTube chat and also running microphones a bit. And Jared McQueen, who is running camera number one. And Mark Clampin is back there running sound. Robert Thompson, who is running camera number two. Connor Nixon, who is running camera number three. And Laurel Kane, who is helping check people in, make sure that they have shown that they're vaccinated and their ID cards. And anyone who I forgot to put on this, you can shoot me afterwards. And then with that, I'll take a motion from a member to adjourn the meeting. A second? All in favor? All opposed? The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>